A couple years back, when I first went to Central as college pastor back in 2016, I uh, very quickly discovered uh, that we had no mission trip planned for spring break. And it was November, and that was on my plate to do. And so I reached out to a friend of mine I'd worked with before who planted a church in Spearfish, South Dakota. Anybody know Spearfish, South Dakota by chance? Oh, all right, we got Spearfish, Spearfish South Dakota is this pretty uh, little town. It's on the north part of the, of the uh, Black Hills, and it's got the third largest university in the state of South Dakota, Black Hills State University. And so I said, hey, so Doug, what if I brought up a group of college students? You know, I, you, you and I have talked about, you have never been able to do a lot of college ministry. What could we do? And so we brainstormed this a trip, and, and Doug had some ideas. Doug's a great church planner, and so we went up there. I took a group of, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 students, and we flew out of Dallas-Fort Worth and, and there to Rapid City and drove over to Spearfish. Now, here's the deal on this, this trip. It was very interesting, one of the things that happened on this trip. Some of our students were getting a little angsty, for lack of a better term, because they felt like we weren't doing enough evangelism. Now, if I'm going to have a problem on a mission trip, that's the single greatest problem I'd ever love to have is a group of students who are frustrated we've not gotten as many opportunities to share the gospel. And some things happened on the trip that, that like some trips, some stuff changed, some doors fell through, some doors opened. And it was interesting as my staff came and said, hey, we think some of our students are really struggling with this. And God brought our text today to mind because on one hand, while I was delighted that I had a group of students who were that passionate about sharing the gospel. On the other hand, it seemed like there was a danger that if it was anything other than sharing the gospel, it was lesser and beneath what we were there to do as believers. We had forgotten the weight of the ministry of encouragement. So if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to invite you. We're back in Philippians today, chapter 2. We're actually going to finish out Philippians chapter 2 this morning. Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to look at maybe the only large passage in Philippians that does not have what I call Hobby Lobby verses. Right? Every other passage we've looked through, somewhere at Hobby Lobby or the Christian bookstore of your choice, you will find plaques or these verses on, on pictures, or we, you will never find a verse from chapter 2, verse 19 through 30 in any of those places. And I think it's significant, especially in light of the story, because oftentimes we forget the truth of what this passage teaches us. So look with me, chapter 2, Philippians, verse 19. Paul's writing and he says, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that you may be encouraged when I learn of your condition, so that I, I also may be encouraged. For I have no one else of, of kindred spirit, of like soul, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for your good. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus, but you know of his proven worth, that is Timothy, his proven worth, that he has served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me, and I trust that in the Lord I myself will also be coming shortly. Here's what Paul says. He says, church family there in Philippi, I am hoping to send Timothy to you. I'm going to send Timothy to you that I may be encouraged, that I may be inspired with confidence, filled with hope. That word may be encouraged comes from the root word suke, which is the word, the Greek word meaning soul or life. What it tells us about encouragement is that the kind of encouragement Paul has in mind is that which fills a person with life. I'm going to send Timothy to check on you, church in Philippi, to see firsthand. I can't come yet. I'm still in house arrest. I'm going to send him so that when I hear from him, when I hear his report of how you're doing, that I would be filled with life. And I'm going to send Timothy because I don't have anyone else like him. Timothy is like sold of the same character. He has the same mindset as I do. And specifically, what sets him apart from everyone else is I know that he will genuinely, without pretense, authentically 
Be concerned. He will, that word concern there is to, to be weighed down with a sense of anxiousness. And the idea is not that, that Timothy is a, a worrier, but it's the idea that there is this deep care and concern for the health of the family of God, the body of Christ, that Timothy possesses that is genuine. When Timothy will roll in there to Philippi and he's concerned for, for what's going on there and whether that means he, he's got to speak truth into hard situations and bring confrontation, whether that means all of a sudden revival breaks out and things are, whatever it means, his intentions and interests in the body of Christ are genuine. There's no pretense. He's not seeking his own interest, whether that be his own thoughts of what the Philippians should be doing or whether that be the use of ministry there in that prominent city of Philippi for his own gain. So I'm going to send Timothy, and you know Timothy. You know of his proven worth, that he's been tested and tried, that he's served. He's literally, he's done the work of a slave in the furtherance of the gospel. Nothing has been beneath him. He has laid his life down for the gospel, and I hope to send him soon to you. I just need to see what's going to happen with me, and I am trusting what Paul says is I am trusting I'm about to be released, and I'm going to head your way as well. So we see Timothy, this this example here in Timothy and, and what Paul thinks of Timothy. But we're also going to meet someone else here. Look at 25. But currently, as in with this letter, I thought it necessary of, of vital importance to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow laborer, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and, and minister to my need because he was longing for you word longing there is this word for a, a deep-seated passion. It's a term that describes the passionate jealousy of God for the worship of his people. It's a term that describes the passion and longing we ought to have as newborns longing for the pure milk of the word. So think of the last time you held a newborn crying out for milk. There's a passion there. It's the kind of passion we ought to have for one another. It's the longing we should have for heaven and the release from a broken body. It says he is longing for you all, and he was distressed. He was torn up to the core on the inside. He was in spiritual anguish. That word is only used three times in all of Scripture. One is here, and the other two describe Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's saying, I, I found it necessary right now, Philippi. I'm going to send Timothy to you. I'm hoping that I'll come eventually, but I am hastily sending Epaphroditus to you because he is longing. There is this deep affection and passion in his life that, that, is, that, is, uh, that is there for you, and, and it flows. He was distressed. There is this anguish because he heard that you heard he was sick. And indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. So Epaphroditus has come. What we know about Epaphroditus, he's obviously a fellow follower of Christ, my brother. He's not just a follower of Christ, but he says Paul calls him his fellow worker. Epaphroditus is a man who has been faithfully laboring, working in the gospel ministry. But he's not just a laborer. Paul says my fellow soldier, which is a term of endearment that, that, that soldier comrades have for one another after they've fought long and hard battle. Epaphroditus is a man then who's not just labored faithfully in the gospel. He is a man who has suffered faithfully in that labor alongside Paul. Paul calls him my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. And he says, and for you, Philippi, he is your messenger. He came from you. The church in Philippi, and we've seen hints of this all throughout the letter, the church in Philippi hears of Paul's state there in house arrest in Rome, and the church sins, unable to do anything directly, the church has sent Epaphroditus as their representative, as their messenger. And Epaphroditus has come, we see in, in, in later on in the book of Philippians in chapter 4, he's brought a financial gift, he comes bearing encouragement, words of life, he comes there to, mess, to be the messenger for the church, but also to 
be the minister to Paul's needs, to serve, to take care of those things which, which Paul has need of. Because remember, Paul's under house arrest, chained to a Roman guard. He has no means of income to pay any bills he incurs. He has no ability to go out to the store. He, has no, he is living completely entirely on the hospitality of the body of Christ and perhaps some strangers. And Epaphroditus has come, and somewhere in this journey, as Epaphroditus has come, he became sick, so sick he was on the verge of death. And that's the last word the church in Philippi has heard. They're not only concerned for Paul, but they're concerned for their brother Epaphroditus. God spares Epaphroditus. He's better, he longs, he misses his church family, he misses those who he labors and, and fellow soldiers with, and... Paul sends him back, and listen to what Paul says as he sends back Epaphroditus. These are commands he gives the church in Philippi. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy. Church in Philippi, as he is back among you, you bring him in, you embrace him, you receive him with joy, with with honor. Hold men like him. Reckon your thoughts as you think about him. Hold him in high regard of great value. Why? Because he came close to dying for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Now, Paul doesn't take a shot at Philippi. What he's saying is, Philippi, you're way over here. You're hundreds of miles away. There is very little outside of praying and raising a collection you can do to serve, but you sent Epaphroditus, and he came, and he lived, and he served, and he's ministered. He has done in my life and ministry what you could not because we're separated by this distance. He has come, and he has labored in a ministry of service and encouragement. He has blessed me. He almost died to do it. And every ounce of what he did with me was the work of Christ, so you receive and honor him. And then chapter 2 ends. And as we'll see in weeks to come, chapter 3 begins and takes us a totally different direction. So Paul writes to the church in Philippi after he's come in in chapter 1 and said, Church, here is your mission. If you're, you're to be a gospel-driven church, and, and so far you're being faithful, but I want to remind you and spur you on that you are to take the gospel as a church body, as one body. You're to be unafraid by those who oppose you in a hostile world. And as you experience suffering in that mission, understand it is a sign of favor of God upon you. It's chapter 1. Paul gives us our mission. In chapter 2, though, he takes a turn because what's going to squash the mission of God in our midst, church family, and the same for the church in Philippi, is not the pressure from the outside world. It's the division from within. And so as we've seen there in chapter 2, Paul calls us not to be driven by our own interests, but to count one another as more important than ourselves, to humble ourselves, and gives us this beautiful example of Christ, and in, and in Humbling ourselves, we walk in unity as we are all working out the salvation that God has given us in fear and trembling because it's God at work within us. And as we go about all those aspects of working out our salvation, we're to do it all without grumbling or complaining that we may shine. And we looked last week at how Paul, Paul refers in there and implies in there that we have this ministry and what Paul does here in bringing to our attention both Timothy and Epaphroditus is he provides you and I two real flesh and blood examples of everything he's been laying out. And the first thing he tells you and I to do in light of these examples is to receive and honor people like this. See, church family, we must receive and honor people like this. Here's a question. Who do we honor in our circles? Who do we honor? Who are the people that we have with our minds held in high regard inside of the church, whether that be in the midst of our own church family or, or maybe broader, inside of global Christianity, American Christianity? Who are the people that we hold with high regard? Are they the big names who write all the books, who speak at all the conferences, who walk with the great Charisma and personality, even though you and I don't know, do they also walk in humility with love and concern for the body of Christ? 
Some do, some don't. Or the people that we honor, not the people who are great in whatever standard we walk by, but are the people who are simply faithful. Faithful. You see, church family, there's a danger in our lives. For many times I've watched it. How many people have we laid up on a pedestal because they're a great communicator, they're effective at what they do, they, whatever this is, only to find out that behind the scenes they don't walk well with Christ at all. In fact, some never walked with Christ at all. And we honor and we labor and we go, man, to be like them, or man, we, we, instead of, what about, what about the Carolyn Browning, who was my fourth grade Sunday school teacher, who taught fourth grade Sunday school for 40 plus years, who prayed for us long after we were in her class, who sowed seeds of the gospel, who wrote us notes, who visited us at our houses, who told the story one day when I was in there of a Bible that a little girl had forgotten one Sunday. But then she told the story of that little girl who grew up to become a missionary and how God, even then as a fourth grader, was starting to sow seeds in my life of what his calling would be. You don't know Carolyn Browning's name. You don't know her face. But one day you're going to see her in heaven honored by the Lord as a well-done and good and faithful servant. See, church family, who do we honor? Because who we honor also reveals who we're striving to be like. Are we striving to be great in, in whatever economy we see, or are we striving to be great in God's eyes? Often we're impressed. It's interesting to me when Papaw's introduced places, um, and I'm with my grandfather, and he'll get introduced to you know, whether it's at chapel in college or chapel in seminary or at a church or function. There's always this, this sheet that the, the introducer will come up with. And inevitably on that sheet, it will always be mentioned, this crusade that Papa helped lead in Africa where thousands, I mean literally thousands, like 10,000 people indicated professions of faith in Christ. Wow. Why don't they mention the fact that Papa has probably written 10 times that many handwritten notes to everybody he can to encourage to build up. You know what was at Papa's retirement ceremony? It wasn't talk about the great crusades he led. It wasn't talk about this, that, and the other. You know what was the biggest thing that stood out? Is the fact that the thousand some odd people in that room, from security guards and back closets at Lifeway, to vice presidents, to church members who hadn't been in his church for 30 years, every one of them would receive notes from him. Notes of encouragement, spurring them on to Christ. See, what, what impresses us what is more impressive to us? Is faithfulness impressive or just big? You see, church family, we've got to be a culture where what we honor, the kind of ministry we honor, is not whether it's big or small, but whether it's faithful. The kind of person, men and women, we honor are not men and women based on how large or small their ministry is. It's whether or not they're faithful. And the kind of men and women you and I should desire to be is not men and women that God uses in some big way, as if big implies large numbers and platform, but are women and men that God uses in a faithful way to impact lives for all eternity. See, church family, these are the kind of people that we must receive, that we must honor, that we must heap honor upon. It means this quite literally, church family. In this room right now, there are faithful men and women who have served the Lord for decades. You've never seen them up here. They've never gotten a retirement celebration. They've never had their picture in the church bulletin. They've never, I don't know what other things we've done to honor people over the years, but they've never had that. But in God's economy... If they laid their life down for the work of Christ, they are worthy of honor. Amen. This passage doesn't just tell us who we are to honor. It goes past that. It sets the example for how you and I are to be. 
It sets the example in light of what we've seen in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Philippians. It gives flesh and blood application to who you and I are to be because you and I must faithfully engage in the work and ministry of Christ. You and I must faithfully engage in the work and ministry of Christ. We saw last week that the work and ministry of Christ is, and from Ephesians 4, it's building up of the body. It's building up of the body. That means it involves disciple making. Listen, there's not one of us who is exempt from sharing the gospel. All of us are called to be gospel sharers. All of us are called to have a part in making disciples and proclaiming the gospel to men and women who do not know Christ and helping lead them to come to saving faith in Christ. And once they're in faith in Christ, to help them grow deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until we are all mature in Christ. Building up of the body is not just seeing people come to faith in Christ. It's the living out of that faith as a community of Christ, the family of God. In fact, I know of a pastor who had a major crisis of faith. Church was growing, booming, lost people coming to faith in Christ. And one of those was a young man who was in a gang. Came to faith in Christ, baptized, cost him everything. And he made this statement to the pastor. He said, man, I know that Jesus is the way, but I'm struggling because now that I've been saved, the challenge is I had far greater family and community in my gang than I do in the church. See, Jesus says they will know we are Christian. How? By the way that we love one another. By the way that we care for one another. You see, to faithfully engage in the work and ministry of Christ means not just disciple-making in terms of seeing new people become disciples, but disciple-making in terms of seeing us as a body of Christ care for one another and live out salvation with each other. And this is what this is going to mean. It's going to mean that we must genuinely be concerned for the welfare of our church family. And that concern has to flow out of a deep love for a body. Go back and look in the text. Did you see that about Epaphroditus? See the words here. Look look back at Timothy. Look at Timothy. I have no one else of like so who will genuinely, without any pretense, be concerned for your good, who who will have a sense of longing, anxiousness, concern for God's good in your midst. Look at Epaphroditus. I'm sending Epaphroditus back to you because there is a longing so passionate in his heart for you, his church family. There is a longing so deep in his heart for you that the word I'm going to use for it is the same same word that describes the passion of God's jealousy, the passion that a a newborn has for, for the milk they can only get from their mother, the passion, the passion that I have to escape this broken body and, and be with the Lord. Church family, is there that kind of longing and passion for one another in our midst? When it's Tuesday afternoon, and your mind starts to wander, whatever you're doing, do you find yourself with a longing and a passion, longing to be with your church family? Do you find yourself with a longing? Do you find yourself with a distress, a sense of, of anxiety because you're concerned with how healthy are we? Bob, who sits across me in my grow group. Susie, who sits across from me. Or make up another name. Or think of somebody real in your mind. Is there a longing, a passion? How are they? Are they well? Are they growing? Is Christ being honored and glorified in their life? What do they need? How can I minister? There must be a longing. There must be a genuine concern for each other. A genuine concern that comes out of a sacred love for each other. I think of a comment my mom made years ago as as times have changed, as we've all bowed to the idol of busyness and engaged in this and that and the other. My mom said, man, I miss the days when you went to church and it was just family. You knew each other because you spent time with each other. You lingered long after. You you, you went to eat with each other. You you knew what was going on in people's lives. You see, somehow, church family, we have arrived at a place in society where we are more connected than ever before, but more disconnected relationally than we've ever been. 
See, if we're going to engage in this work, there's got to be a concern. This, this concern means that when we care for one another, it's real. There's a great little company called Sunday Cool. Uh, does a lot of youth stuff. In fact, I'm sure Matt uh, Downing knows of it. And they, they make these goofy videos. And one of their videos is called Translating the Christian Language. And they, they say a lot of things you and I will have heard if you've lived any amount of your life in the church. But then they translate it and give you what, what, what does the person really mean? So the guy looks and says, I'm here for you, brother. Translation, I want to seem supportive, but I really hope you don't reach out. <laughs> now we laugh because we also know that at times it's true. Hey man, I'll pray for you. Never did we utter a word to the Lord about it. Hey man, anything I can do for you, let me know. But we never check back in. We never see what's there. You see, we can be disgenuine by offering things we don't intend to follow up through. We can be disgenuine by all of a sudden making it all about us, that I engage in ministry, I do things in ministry for the building up of whatever my platform is. That's the word that the young people use today, platform or influence or, or whatever my ministry is. We can engage wrongly in ministry when we see one another, not as brothers and sisters to serve with genuine care out of Christ for one another, but as people who can help us jump to the next Step whatever that is we've placed in our mind. Is there a genuine care for one another? And if there is a genuine care for one another, it will lead us out of this sacred love for one another, this genuine care for one another, will lead us to engage in ministry not for our own interests, but His. Church family, it's shocking and appalling when you really start to see with open eyes, how many ways you can make God's ministry about yourself. And understand the weight of Paul's statement. Think how many people Paul knew and had access to. He was there in Rome where there was a growing, thriving church, and literally he says, I don't have, generally speaking, anyone around me I can send who will legitimately be concerned for God's interest in your life other than Timothy. I realize all the time, even in my own life, I see the temptations, the way Satan can take and turn, and all of a sudden it goes from, man, Lord, I want to make sure I preach a clear message this morning for your glory to, man, well, how many people responded? How many people came down? How many people are sharing on social media? Let me go on Facebook. Did anybody comment on the sermon today? Did anybody... How many people can I say I discipled? Who did I meet? How did I do this? Man, I look and I see this person's ministry over here, and this is growing, and this is thriving. Look how many D-Nows are getting to speak out. Conferences over here, and all of a sudden, little jealousy creeps up. You see, it's easy. I see it all the time in my world, in, in, in pastoral world, but it's even beyond that. Think about this. How many times have I heard... We've gone on a mission trip, and there's a report to the church on that mission trip, and, and we've, got, we've got Johnny up here, and Johnny, tell us about this trip that you took, and there Johnny talks about all this trip, and then we ask this question. Johnny, if you could only say one reason why other people in the church ought to go on mission trip, what would it be? And this is inevitably what comes out. You should go on a mission trip because it'll change your life. I should do something for God so I get something out of it. Now listen, hear me. I am all about if you go on a mission trip and God changes your life. That is a wonderful thing. But let's also be clear. You and I don't go on mission trips so we can get an experience from God. We go on mission trips because we have experienced God. And in experiencing God, he says, go. And if as we go, our life is transformed, awesome. And if as we go, we're poured out and exhausted, wonderful. As long as he be glorified, you see, because we cannot be about our interests but the interests of Christ. Timothy and Epaphroditus, they didn't care if they received glory from ministry. There wasn't a glory to be had for them. They were associated with Christ and with Paul. There was no Christian culture where they were going to get a first century book deal and speak at a large conference. There was no social media presence for them to be an influencer. Rather, all they were were men simply transformed by and compelled by the Christ who humbled himself, who left heaven, who took on flesh, who was crucified and died, who was risen and exalted, and who's coming back. 
Church family, if we're going to engage and, and be faithful in, in ministry, in the work and ministry of Christ, there must be a genuine affection for each other that's driven by a true love for one another that eliminates us caring for each other for any other reason then that's the example we see in Christ and that's the command we have from Christ. We don't do it for what we get out of it. We don't do it for how we can make something great. We don't do it for who can know. We don't secretly go serve this person because I know if I serve this person, they bake the best cookies as a thank you gift. (laughs) We don't do it like that. If we're going to faithfully engage in the ministry and work of Christ, we'll do it from a genuine heart with a passion and affection for one another, and it's going to mean ministering to the needs of the body. Do you see that about Epaphroditus, verse 25? He's your messenger and minister to my need. And then drop down what he came close to death, verse 30, for the work of Christ. You see, church family, there is a ministry the work and ministry of Christ that involves caring for each other's needs. It's a ministry that's personal. You can't minister to people you don't know. Not, that, not this kind of personal ministry. Yes, I know some will say, well, you can, you, can, you know, when we do some, uh, Samaritan's uh, purse, when we give, that's ministry. Yes, I get that. But I mean daily life ministry. You can't minister to people you don't know, and you can't minister to needs you don't have a clue about. Vice versa, you may have a need. Guess what? Most likely your need can't be ministered to if nobody knows it's there. You see, here's the reality. There are some needs in our lives that God intends to meet either through us stepping in to minister to that person or or needs in our life that are intended to be met by people that God raises up. Isn't it interesting? Paul never struggled to ask the churches to pray for him. But some of us are real resistant to saying, hey, I need prayer. So such ministry is personal. Such ministry is intentional. Listen, church family, we have no excuse to not know and keep up with one another. I want you to think about this. Philippi and Rome, the travel between was somewhere between 700 and 1,200 miles depending on the route you took. It could take anywhere as short as six weeks or as long as three months. Yet Philippi, way over here, they could have said, man, we hope Paul's doing well. Guess we'll find out one day. No, no. They sent, they already sent letters, and now they sent someone to go, and now Paul's sending someone back. You realize the amount of time and intentionality it took, church family? You and I have things as simple as this phone that we can rattle off a text in five seconds, and we don't. When you look around your grow group, who hadn't been there in two weeks? Do you know Why? Who's someone that used to be here that, oh, well, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're just staying at home from COVID. Do we know why? You see, church family, there's a ministry to one another. It's impersonal. It's intentional. It's, it's not just intentional, but it's tangibly experienced in our life. It means that there's a presence. Epaphroditus was with Paul. It means we give time. It wasn't just with Paul in, in terms of presence, but he spent time listening, talking, praying, serving. It's, it's tangibly experienced through, through financial gifts. Epaphroditus brought money because Paul had no source of income. That was one way to help. It was service. Who knows what Epaphroditus did day in and day out? You see, church family, there's ways we can care for one another and all of that. We can be present when that time of crisis comes. We can sacrifice our time to listen to that person who's really going through it. Or maybe to sacrifice our time to listen to the way that this person is rejoicing because God answered some major prayer in their life and we should... Not just weep with those who weep, but also rejoice with those who rejoice. Service ways. I think of when my grandmother was murdered in that week, and, and we were all this way and that way trying to figure out what was going on. And there was a, 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 a young lady at the time who was a single adult who'd been in my parents' ministry um, in College Station. They weren't there anymore, and she was in between jobs. She came up for the whole week, and all she did was just present, take care of what we need. She washed her clothes. She cooked us food. She did that because she could. That's what the kind of ministry, this kind of ministry is tangibly experienced in the lives of others. And here's where we've been building to, church family. Ultimately, this kind of ministry is centered on encouragement. What's Paul say about Timothy? I'm sending him that that I may be encouraged. What it is that Epaphroditus did? We don't know all that Epaphroditus did. We know he was present. We know he took care of Paul. We know that that he, he ministered to Paul. Well, what was that ministry? What was he doing there? 
He brought a financial gift, yes, that helped, but, but what was he doing there with Paul? He was encouraging. He was spurring him on. He was praying with him. He was weeping with him. He was listening to him. He was encouraging him. Think, church family, how many more years of ministry was Paul filled up with life for because Epaphroditus risked his life to go encourage him? You see, church family, encouragement matters. And the tongue is the power of life and death. Real encouragement matters. Not false flattery. Don't just say nice stuff to say nice stuff, but we should freely encourage one another. Encouragement at the Spirit's direction can alter a life. And understand, God takes it seriously. There's a spiritual gift of encouragement. Now listen, all of us, whether you have the spiritual gift or not, God calls all of us to encourage one another. We're to exhort one another, to spur one another on. I can recount countless passages that tell us to encourage one another. If you have the spiritual gift, it means you're like a double encourager. You're like encourager squared. And constantly, I, you know, you get into conversation of spiritual gifts. What spiritual gift do you have? I've got the gift of encouragement. I meet more people who claim the gift of encouragement. But here's my question. If so many in the church have the gift of encouragement, why are our churches so discouraged? Could it be that like my students on the mission trip, we believe that simply a ministry of encouragement, that's just kind of too cheesy, maybe sounds a little too self-help, maybe that just doesn't seem that big of a deal. Listen, it's a big enough deal that a man whose only ministry to Paul was encouraging him got a half a chapter of the eternal word of God written in his honor. Apparently, encouragement is a big deal to God's heart because it's at the core, according to Hebrews 10, of when we come together when we choose not to neglect the coming together, that we spur one another on. Cheech Church family, we live in a world that is inherently discouraging. There is no encouragement that should ever come from looking around at a broken world and a broken people. But you and I have been reconciled to the King. You and I have the ability and have been given spiritual gifts. We can encourage one another. We ought to, when the world looks at the church, they shouldn't see doom and gloom heads down. They ought to see the most encouraged, filled with life people in the world because we take seriously the ministry that God has called us to, caring for one another. So church family, who's God laid on your heart and mind? Who's... Who do you need to reach out to today? And by the way, don't think I'm just asking you. I've asked myself all morning, and I'm making a list in my mind of people I haven't seen I need to reach out to. Who do you need to write a note to? Who's God bugged and bugged and bug you about for months, and you've never reached out? Maybe you need to not only reach out, but say, I am so sorry. I have failed you as a brother or sister in Christ because I have not reached out to you. Please forgive me. Listen, we should not wait till people are dead to tell them encouraging things. Just as a total side note, if God has used someone to touch your life, well, that's a pastor, a teacher, a friend, whatever. If God has used someone to touch your life, do not wait to their funeral to not tell them. Tell them now. Encourage them now. Who has God laid in front of us? But understand this, church, if we're going to faithfully engage in this work and ministry of Christ, it means that you and I have to lay down and risk our life. And you go, wait a minute. Lay down and risk our life for encouragement? Yes, lay down and risk our life for encouragement. Do you notice where this is coming in? Timothy, I'm going to send him to you. He's well-proven. Well-proven means he's been tested. He's been tried. He's experienced hardship. Not only that, but he's served, and that word means to lay down like a slave. You see, you and I must risk our lives. If nothing else, we have to risk giving up our self-centered focus. It's not about you and me when we walk in here. It's about God and everyone else. And if we'll keep our eyes on God, God will give us our daily bread. And if we'll keep our eyes on God, maybe, just maybe, we might encourage the body, listen, laboring for the sake of Christ demands our lives. It'll cost you and I, uh, it'll cost us time, it'll cost us energy, it'll cost us comfort, it will cost us convenience, it may cost us money, it will cost us rest, it could even cost us death. 
And it's not about what you and I would give, but what Christ would give through you. How can you call and ask someone how they're doing and give up that time to listen for the next 30, 45 minutes as they pour their lives out? How can you ask to pray and, and not only ask how you can pray, but then pray and then pray several times and then follow up with them a week later and ask how you can continue to be praying? We live in a world that says boundaries. And listen, there's nothing unbiblical with having healthy boundaries. I'm not telling. I would make this joke with college students. I'm not saying in all of this that, guys, you should rush out and go find the girl you like across the gym and ask him how you can pray for him and subtly try to score a date. That's not what we're talking about. The girl has a right to have a boundary and say, no, leave me alone, creep. <laughs> boundaries are okay, but oftentimes we use boundaries to go, wow, I should really call that person going through that thing. But I've got all this on my schedule. I need to set some boundaries and not do that. Listen, sometimes in the ministry and work of Christ, it does demand you and I actually exert some effort and lay ourselves down. See, perhaps the reason the work of Christ and the encouragement of the body is so low is because in truth, we are so self-focused. We're not sensitive enough to hear the Spirit to sense His prompting. We're too busy with our lives to follow through on His leading. We're too infatuated with looking to others to fill us rather than pouring out what God has called us to do. Perhaps our love for each other in the body is so little because our love for ourselves is so great. There's a story from one of, uh, I don't know if you've, it's a great book. It's called The Insanity of God. It's written by a former missionary whose son died on the mission field, and it really caused he and his wife a crisis of faith. And, and he began to go all throughout the world and, and meet with various individuals from the persecuted church. And he was meeting with, with, a, with a, a man in, in the former Soviet Union where there was a pastor sent to prison. The wife and the children were packed up and sent to a dilapidated cabin in the outskirts of the woods of Siberia. And there in that cabin, they ran out of food one night. It's freezing. They have no food. The, the, the last piece of bread was gone. The last tea and water they had was gone. They went to bed hungry and hurting. And so they prayed and asked the Lord to help. The kids even asked their mom, where, where are we going to get some food, Mama? We're hungry. Do you think Papa even knows where we live? Their mother, all the mother could assure them was, I don't know if Papa knows where we live, but our Heavenly Father does, and he will provide. Now, 18 and a half miles away, there's a small village, and in that village, there lived a deacon. In the middle of the night, God woke him up, and the Holy Spirit told him, you need to get out of bed, you need to harness your horse, you need to hitch the sled to the horse, load up all of the extra vegetables that the church has harvested, the meat, the other food that the congregation's collected, and you need to take it to that pastor's family way on the outskirts. They're hungry. And the deacon is telling uh, the writer of the book this story, and he, hey, this is how the deacon, let me just read you how the deacon says. It says, the deacon responded, but Lord, I can't do that. It's below zero outside. My horse might freeze. I might freeze. And the Holy Spirit replied, you must go. The pastor's family is in trouble. So the deacon fought back. Lord, you've got to know that there are wolves everywhere. They could eat my horse, and if they do, then they'll eat me. I may never make it back. And then the Holy Spirit responded, you don't have to come back. You have to go. Church family, I don't know what needs exist in our body because I'm not God. I know some as they're brought to me. I know some as the Lord lays things on my heart and I try to do my best to reach out. By no means am I perfect. I'm not exempt from this sermon. But church family, understand the call today is for you and I to actually passionately, deeply love each other, to be genuinely concerned for the interest of God in each other's lives, for that to drive us to faithfully engage in the work and ministry of Christ, a work and ministry which involves caring for basic needs and encouraging one another, and it will cost you and I at times. And the question in front of us today is not what will we get out of it, not will we come back. The question is, will we go? Amen. Will we pick up the phone? Will we knock on the door? Will we rock across Grow Group? Will we go? I pray so. Let's go to the Lord. Father, the question's there, Lord. Holy Spirit, there's the question. The question is not, will we come back? The question is, will we go? Lord, I know there are needs. I, 
this, this day and time where there are needs upon needs. Some of those needs are physical. God, there's spiritual needs. There's needs for fellowship. It's one of the greatest grips of society that's, that's even leading to suicide is simply loneliness. God, there's sorrows that long for community around them to weep with them to pray with them. God, there are joys that long to be, to be shared for, for all of our mutual encouragement. God, you, you have called one of all of us, not just to you, but in our calling us to you, you have allowed us to be a church family and called us to a ministry in which we labor and care for each other. Holy Spirit, make us that people. And may we have open hands, Lord, to follow you and to go when you lead us, when you prompt us, Spirit, even if it seems kind of crazy, may we go. Holy Spirit, as you move right now, may you find us faithful to respond. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.